Um, and then Peter comes to him and says, How many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times, which is quite generous in, in Peter's eyes. And then Jesus tells a parable, which we're now going to reenact. So I need a king. Who, who, um, it's like school. If you want to take part, you put your hand up. If you don't put your hand up, I will pick you. Thank you, Mark. We have a king. Your crown is there on the floor. Can you pick it up and put it on your head? Come on. You're a child now. Of course you can see. There. Put it on. Excellent. Very kingly, isn't he? He needs a throne. You need a throne, actually. Kings don't stand, do they? There you go. Have a seat. <laughs> Excellent. So now the king, and we need um, a couple of helpers. Yeah, Colin, we want. Yeah, Benjamin. Brilliant. Uh, you stand either side of the king. Fantastic. You just sort of look very um, kingly servantly. Very good. Excellent. So. Um, the king reckons it's time to settle up debt. Um, that's what he needs to say. Time to settle up debt. All right. So um, we're going to call the first servant in. Any, any willing volunteer? Obviously, if he says it, if this, yeah, right. Very good. Right, um, I have to inform you that this man in front of you owes you 10,000 talents, which is, which is massive. All right, um, pay up. Yeah, go on. Yeah, that's the spirit. Go on. But he can't. He's got no money. So the king, well, the only thing that um, he can say then is, um, <laughs> no, that's a different story. He ordered that his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. <laughs> exactly. The servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, and I will pay back everything. <laughs> now the king, much to the surprise of his fellows, his, of his servants, bless you, the king's presence, go with your head, took pity on him and cancelled all his debt. So the servant went out. <laughs> now, you, you freeze. You're in the background for the next bit. When the servant, however, went out, he saw a fellow servant. Pick one. <laughs> Pick a fellow servant. Ha, <laughs> who owed him a hundred denarii. He grabbed him <laughs> and began to choke him. <laughs> began to choke him and said, pay back what do you owe me. <laughs> his fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay his debt. <laughs> when the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told the master everything that had happened. The master called the servant in. 
and said, you wicked servant, I can't... I cancel that debt of yours because you begged me. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured. Don't play this one out. <laughs> Until he should pay back all he owned. <laughs> Thank you. Have a seat. Give him a round of applause. And then Jesus said, this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. Kingdom living. I don't know how much influence the queen, our monarch, has on your daily life. When, when we learned English in school, we apparently, allegedly, were taught the queen's English. Apparently, she, her, her linguistic skills have a huge influence on the entire country's English, uh, which is just not true. Her influence on Britain <laughs> is minimal. We like to watch her on telly or not, um, but that's about it. Anybody see the Queen's speech for... Yeah, see? See what I mean? The influence is not vast, is it? However, God's influence on his kingdom is 100% kingdom being his church, his people. Um, he identifies himself with his brothers and sisters, and he, he says, the church is my bride, and I will build my church. Um, his influence on his kingdom, how people live, is 100%. He's right in there, interested in every little detail, um, not just himself. So this morning, I want to um, tell you three things. Um, uh, theology, dogmatics, and ethics. Theology is thinking of God. Um, that's all it is. It's nothing heretical or anything like that. Um, ethics is our daily living, um, how our Christians should behave, and, and dogmatics is sort of principles of faith. Because the Bible, of course, is, a, a comp as you saw this morning, is a compilation of stories and events and, and parables and and so uh, dogmatics tries to um, draw out some principles, a bit more understandable, memorable. Now, good Christian ethics always comes from good dogmatics, which comes from good theology. That's how it works, how Christians live. So Peter asks the question, how often do we forgive? And this really is a question about ethics, dogmatics, and theology. How should I live as a Christian? What are the principles of faith and how do they apply? In other words, what's God like? What, because God's got such a huge influence on his kingdom, the question really is, what, what's God like? And how does that then reflect on how I see my faith and how I live my faith out? And as with a lot of things, when questions get really complicated, Jesus tells a very simple story. And, you know, I really love that about him. He could go, well, there are the following 16 bullet points you have to consider uh, with sub points A, B, C. And, you know, Jesus didn't teach like that. He told a very simple story. But the beauty of it is that the story really hits home. Far more memorable, far more um, heart-hitting than five bullet points could ever be because by the time you leave this morning you will probably remember the story but you wouldn't remember five bullet points which makes me speaking about the simple story kind of anyway so first of all we have a very fair king thank you Mark for playing that role so brilliantly because first he lets his um, subjects accumulate debt that's quite something isn't it? Otherwise, living uh, just wouldn't be possible if the king would just not let them do anything, um, wouldn't give them a, a start capital or a bit of allowance to go over, um, to, for, I don't know, for trading or living or whatever. A very fair king. And, uh, and that period of grace 
he's actually very gracious because the king didn't have to. The king could just carry on living and looking after his, his own. Um, which, even in our day, the, the well, not the, he's not king yet, but Prince Charles and the whole royal family do an awful lot for charity and, and help people, no matter what you think of the monarchy, I don't know. Um, but in this story, he's a very fair king. And then, of course, it's also his good right to call it, to say, right, now we're going to settle things up. Now we're going to settle all the debt. Uh, we're going to look at the accounts. <laughs> Sorry, and because uh, the January and, and the January deadline is looming, isn't it? We're going to look at all the accounts and uh, weigh it up, and uh, we'll see where you're at. So it's calling in the debt. And that's what God is like. In Act 17, verse 30 and a bit, it says this. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, for he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. Talking about Jesus here. So God is very gracious with us. You know, the little sins that we sort of accumulate, the harsh words we say, the, the nasty thoughts we, we have, and so on, God doesn't call it every single time. Um, it's not true that God judges the little sins straight away. It's, not, it's, a, <laughs> it's just not true. It'd be an awful way to live, wouldn't it? If as soon as you step over the mark, bang, like that, you know, it's like as soon as you park in the double L's, traffic wardens there and put stuff on it. Um, as soon as you go over the speed and you flash three points. It's not like that. There is a period of grace that, that God overlooks. But then there will come a day where he will call it. It'll be like poker. Right? I want to see. Now we're going to wreck him. God is love. He's, he's gracious. He gives freedom. He wants us to do well but is also holy. He can't simply overlook things all the time. I said to my driving school pupils when they say, what happens if I go over the speed limit on my test? I said, well, it really depends, doesn't it? If you, if you do sort of 33 in a 30, nobody's going to raise an eyebrow and fail you there and then and take the keys off you and cancel the test. <laughs> as long as you recognize it and come back down. But if you consistently drive over the speed limit, they won't like that. God is love. He overlooks and lets us live. And, and even in our, as Christians, he doesn't point out every single sin. Aren't you glad of that? There comes a point where God points out some sins for you to work on, some shortcomings, some misconceptions about him. Um, and we become aware of it and we can work at it. But he doesn't do it on day one. Gives you a whole catalog of things you need to be work, working on. Because that would just be cruel and overwhelming. And quite frankly, say, <laughs> you'd walk. But he can't overlook things forever. He can't turn a blind eye forever. Because you know what? That wouldn't be fair. Because he's also just. So somebody has to pay because it's actually, what we're talking about is real debt, which is what the guy had. He had 10,000 talents worth of debt. I did some workings out on that. One talent, um, I read, is about 20 years of a day laborer's wages. Get that? One talent is 20 years of a day laborer's wages. So I worked it out at six pounds 31, which is the, um, uh, minimum wage at the moment, 40 hours a week times 52 weeks a year, because then in them days you didn't get a holiday to go to Spain or something, times 20 years times 10,000 talents works out at 2,624,960,000 pounds worth of debt. That's what the guy, don't ask me how he managed to accumulate such huge amount of debt. 
2,624,960,000 pounds worth of debt. That's a ridiculous amount of debt. Not a minimum wage. <laughs> In no way would this servant ever be able to pay this back. The question is, how did he accumulate such a ridiculous amount of debt? If we think of it in the terms of, of our debt towards God, Romans 3, 23. We have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Fall short of the glory of God. That's what it's about, really. So it's not just um, murder, uh, theft, eating cake when you're in a diet, and those sort of um, deadly sins that we're talking about. It's simply just falling short of the glory of God. It's simply not being quite a hundred percent. Bill Hybels tells a story that when they uh, built their uh, building with a uh, building contractor, um, they then had the final inspection where they sort of said, yeah, the building contractors did their job well and they signed it off. And uh, they found a few imperfections and one of the uh, people there uh, even put a, a spotlight, you know, one of those ones, onto the imperfections where the, yeah, dodgy plastering or whatever it was onto the light and the contractor said now hang on a minute um, in the contract it says that inspections are to be carried out in normal daylight you're not allowed to shine an extra bright light onto the imperfections um, because at normal daylight it looks just fine see at normal daylight most of our lives are just about fine but once God's huge ultra bright light of holiness shines onto it it reveals a different story we owe a ridiculous amount not just a few pence god is holy and any impurity shows up now the servant realized two billion whatever it was um, that's a ridiculous amount begging is going to be the only option Begging is the only option. There is no way I can ever pay this back. Forgiveness is the only solution. Romans 10 says this, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified and it is with your mouth that you confess and you are saved. As the scriptures say, anyone who puts his, puts, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Begging is going to be the only option. Um, throwing yourself at the mercy of God is the only option because there's no way we can ever pay it back ourselves. And you know, the merciful king takes pity and cancels all the debt. That's all it takes. No further hoops to jump through. No 69 Hail Marys to recite daily. Um, no other works and no other, uh, I don't know, trips to Lourdes or, or whatever, whatever else. No other books to read, nothing. This is it. Cancel the debt because we've got a merciful king. Um, when we confess and when we, you know, obviously the servant, sorry and God forgives. Just like that. Now, what about the cost? Because um, it's obviously costly for the master losing two million pounds. Um, uh, sorry, two billion pounds. That's quite a hefty cost, and somebody has to pay. It's not like our government that can say, "Well, we've just sort of messed the introduction of the IT system. Or we'll have to write off four hundred million." Um, for them it's easy because they don't have to carry the cost but somebody has to carry the cost the debt just won't go away by closing your eyes well God had to carry the cost himself Jesus he carried the cost 
the wages of sin are death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Simple as. God carries the cost himself. The two billion pounds, a ridiculous amount of debt. That's not considering inflation, by the way. All right. Um, we owe God a considerable amount, a ridiculous amount. No way could we pay, but he just carries the cost and writes it off. How fantastic is that? And then the story takes a turn in order to answer Peter's question. He finds himself an un, uh, another servant who owes him a hundred denarii. Now, one denarii, I found out, is equivalent to a day's wage. So that's six pounds 31 times eight hours a day um, times a hundred, because it's a hundred denarii, uh, adds up to 5,048 pounds. The amount forgiven by the master is disproportionately bigger than the amount not forgiven by the servant. You just cannot compare. It's not on the same scale, is it? It's not. You, you can't really compare the two billion with the five grand. In other words, on the other hand, though, five grand is also a considerable amount of debt. It's, you also can't just forget about it. You know, you can't ignore it. It's still a considerable amount of money, although nowhere near as much. Now, in Matthew 5, a bit earlier on, in the same book, it says... Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. And then in the Lord's prayers, you know, we read, Forgive us our debt, as we also have forgiven our debtors. So the king calls him back. Now, I was thinking about that. Um, was the king allowed to just call him back and go back on his word? They had a deal, right? Debt was forgiven. Um, does God ever go back on his forgiveness? Does he ever sort of revoke our salvation because we're not forgiving? Answer, no. Um, your salvation, my salvation depends on God's grace. Not how I act, not what I do or don't do. Um, it says in John 10, 28, that nothing, nothing at all can pull us out of Jesus' hand. And in, in um, 1 Corinthians 3, Paul writes about something else, but it makes sense in this case as well. If any man builds on his foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. If it is burnt up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. In other words, what we do, how we live as Christians, is still important, because we can build stuff that's good, or we can build stuff that will just sort of... <laughs> and it's gone. But we ourselves will be saved, no matter what we do. God doesn't go back on his word. However, if the servant fully understood and accepted his master's forgiveness, he would have been merciful himself. How much has anyone grasped the enormity of God's forgiveness when they can't forgive someone else? How can somebody have fully grasped and understood and, and believe it in, your heart, in their heart when they've, def when they've been forgiven two billion pounds and then to throttle somebody over five grand? And the key, really, is Peter's question to the whole thing that triggered the whole, the, the whole story. He says, how often... Shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times. <laughs> Just, 
what a question. You know, I mean, bless him, Peter. He asks all the right questions, but they are slightly, slightly bizarre. Are you seriously asking me how many times you must forgive um, when you've just been forgiven two billion pounds, when you've just had your, your bum saved out of hell, when you just had your whole eternity sorted, when you just have been saved by my grace, are you really asking me how many times you should forgive your brother who uh, says a nasty word to you or he doesn't call you when he should have or doesn't come and visit you when he should have or, or forgot to bring the book you asked him to bring? You, are you serious? <laughs> it's almost the question. And by that story, Jesus just shows how, how ridiculous the comparison even is. Because remember, my sin took Jesus' life. My debt he paid. My sin took Jesus' life. The cost of my forgiving is tiny in comparison. Now, the book of James works this out, that, that faith and works, um, how we believe and how that works out in, in Christian living, go together. You can't separate the two. You can't, he says, uh, faith without works is dead faith in the first place. So the question is, in this story, if the servant can just throttle somebody over five grand, how much has he actually understood of what just was offered to him? And has he fully grasped it? Recap. So theology means that God loves us. He's absolutely holy and incredibly just. He forgives because we sin, because we mess up, because we ignore and we're ignorant. But he loves us no matter what. And then he's actually paid the price by sending Jesus to die on the cross. And that's all within God. How brilliant. How wonderful that is. And then the principles of faith, dogmatics say, when we repent, when we say sorry, when we throw ourselves on our knees like the servant did and beg for forgiveness, God forgives. When we forgive, when we confess, God forgives. And then ethics, Christian living, really says that God's mercy towards us should make us merciful towards others. It's a natural process because how could anybody be unmerciful when he's just been so merciful, retreated by God? And that way, <clears throat> we're actually living out God's character in our midst. You see, we, we're living out um, theology. We're living out God's character, who he is. We're living out love, holiness, and justice in our midst. And how wonderful and, and that is to be part of and how attractive that is in a community where mistakes don't have to be um, ignored. They can be named. Um, they can be spoken out, but they can also be forgiven. How different that is to what's happening out there where, where to get along you have to hide your mistakes otherwise you're out or you can't make mistakes and you're under huge amounts of pressure because you know as soon as you make a mistake you're out um, how different that is in, in our community here where we can be gracious and merciful towards each other because God's been merciful to us let's pray Lord God, I thank you that you are just so incredibly gracious to us. That your love for us just surpasses absolutely everything. I thank you, Lord, that um, even though you, you're 100% loving and 100% holy, that somehow love still wins. That you don't just snuff us out. You don't you aren't the, the transcendent God up there that we somehow need to reach with our, with our great living, with our works, with our achievements. But you do approach us with, with mercy and love and justice and that you take the debt upon yourself. 
And that's the biggest miracle of all, that you sent your son to die on that cross for us so that the price is paid. The debt has actually been paid off. And I thank you for that. And Lord, I pray that as we study your character, as we realize how merciful you are towards us, I pray that that will transform the way we, we are with one another. I pray that um, your, your love and your, your justice and your holiness will just be so evident in this community here. So that, as Jesus says in, um, in John, that um, people will look at us and our love and will realize that we are your disciples because of the way we love one another, because the way we treat each other, the way we, we can own up about mistakes that we made um, between one another, and the way we forgive one another, and the way that community works um, with imperfect people in a beautiful way. Thank you so much, Lord God. Amen.